Paul, writing under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit, concludes by explaining what the fruit of the Spirit is by first prefacing his explanation at length by explaining what it is not. But he finishes his introduction or his prologue by telling us something. That I have forewarned you that those who practice such things in verse 21 shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Notice he is writing to Christians. He is writing to believers. He is not writing to unsaved people. He's writing to people who claim to be saved. Again, this is one of the verses that people who are given to believe in unconditional, once saved, always saved, have a problem with. They'll have to say something like, oh, he must be talking about non-believers. Well, in the context, he's obviously talking, he's warning believers. Now, he's not saying those who do these things or who fall into them. That's wrong, but he says those who practice them. If somebody is truly born again, they will not practice these things. Now, if somebody is in what the New Testament defines as an adulterous marriage, they're practicing it. They're practicing it. If somebody is driven and motivated by selfish ambition that generates strife and hatred for the brethren, they're practicing it. Such people do not have the assurance of salvation unless they repent. They do not have the assurance of salvation unless they repent. Now, I do believe that the Lord does not save people to lose them. I do believe the good shepherd leaves the 99 for the one. I do believe the Lord will bring correction into the life of a believer who goes into these things. But we should not make the mistake of saying that believers cannot do these things or cannot practice them. If they couldn't do these things or not practice them, there'd be no reason for Paul to warn they could. You see the same kind of faulty argumentation all the time. Jesus made it very clear in the last days, if possible, the elect will be deceived. Well, I heard people who are into various deceptions say, well, if possible, but it's not possible for the elect to be deceived. And speaking of the last days, Jesus warned about deception in the church four times as much as he warned about anything else. He warned about wars one time, rumors of wars one time, famines one time, earthquakes one time, pestilence one time, etc. It's always one time, one time, one time. He warns about deception perpetrated against Christians four times more than he warned about anything else. Why would Jesus repeatedly warn about something that couldn't happen? (laughs) It doesn't make sense. This kind of argumentation is reductio ad absurdum. <laughs> they, they, they arrive at an absurd conclusion because they have an absurd presupposition. It can't mean what it seems to say, so therefore it must mean something else. <laughs> it can't mean what it seems to say, so therefore it must mean something else. They begin playing games with the Scripture. The Scripture is quite clear. Those who practice such things shall not enter the kingdom of God. If we are practicing these things as believers, we have to pray that the Lord will bring correction, remedy into our lives. Then he goes on after this. Verse 22. But, however, the fruit of the Spirit is what the fruit of the Spirit is. Here it's singular in Greek, not plural. What the fruit of the Spirit is. Agape. We might say agape is the fruit of the Spirit. All of the other things that we would consider to be fruits of the Spirit, plural, are attributes of agape. They all come from agape, from God's unconditional love. The fruits of the Spirit are attributes of agape, but agape itself is the fruit. If somebody really has the love of Jesus, they're going to manifest these other attributes. The first one he talks about is keras, keras. 
joy. But the fruit of the Spirit is, first of all, agape, agape. Then, terra, terra, joy. Terra, joy. If something is said publicly and taught publicly, the person who teaches it is publicly responsible for it. If somebody teaches a doctrine to the church publicly, they're publicly responsible for it. One of the worst sermons I ever heard in my life, and the worst sermon I ever heard in Australia in my life, was up in Queensland. There was a gentleman, Christian, well-known, uh, Cole Springer, that's his name, and I'm only telling you what he taught. He gave a sermon on the verse, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And he was telling stories, anecdotes, one after another. One of the stories he told was how his bungalow up near Cairns somewhere burned down. And it was the joy of the Lord that sustained him through the disappointment of having his holiday home burned down. He spoke for over an hour, did not mention Jesus Christ one time. And what he was doing with his anecdotes, the joy of the Lord, the focus exegetically is the Lord. The joy derives from knowing him in the circumstance. He was taking the focus off the Lord, he didn't mention Jesus, and put it on the joy. So it was the joy that sustained him through the disappointment. And he was telling these men how he just laughed it off. Well, you can laugh it off when you have insurance. If you have fire insurance, you can laugh it off, I suppose. But what happens when the phone rings and God forbid your son or daughter was killed in a car crash? You can't laugh that off. The joy is not going to see you through. The Lord will see you through. <laughs> his entire way of thinking is completely convoluted and is typical of what has become of so much of the church today. What masquerades as exposition of Scripture today is motivational psychology. It's simply hype. It's simply motivational psychology using Christian jargon. But it's not biblical. What is the joy of the Lord? When Jesus was on the cross, we are told, he considered the joy set before him. But there's no joy in being nailed to the cross by Roman pagans and rejected by your own people. There's no joy in being tortured. There's no joy in, in torture. He considered the joy set before him. The joy of the Lord has to do with our trust, our faith, in an ultimate certainty. It is a joy that may be in spite of circumstances, not because of it. It transcends circumstances because of our relationship with him. People can be in very adverse circumstances and still have the joy of the Lord. Even in the worst of circumstances, when Jesus was taking our sin on the cross, the joy was set before him. Now, in human terms, we can only relate to this up to a certain point. One of the illustrations Scripture uses to explain this in a way we can relate to it, or at least half of us can, is maternal labor. No one likes birth contractions. No one in their right mind enjoys maternal labor. But everybody loves a little baby. If you focus on the maternal labor, <laughs> the kid's not worth it. If you focus on the baby, the maternal labor is worth it. <laughs> you consider the joy set before you. Paul talks about this. It's always our blessed hope. It's always the coming of Jesus. It's always the millennial reign of Christ. It's always heaven. It's always a certainty in the future, irrespective of present circumstances. 
what a backslider basically is, is somebody who stops trusting in what's coming and begins in trusting what's here now. One of the reasons that the Lord allows believers to undergo so many problems sometimes and why unsaved people tend to have it so good so often. Job and Jeremiah both bemoan the fact, why did the wicked prosper? But then I perceived their end. God only corrects his children. The Lord gives each of us a cross because without it, we would begin to trust in this world. Without the cross, we would begin to trust in this world. Again, what does Paul say? That you would not do the things that you would. <laughs> Without that cross, we'd begin to trust in this world. No matter how successful somebody may be, fantastic family, fantastic marriage, no matter how successful someone may be in their business or profession, top of the ladder, top of the income level, no matter how successful by God's grace someone may be in the ministry, there's always going to be a cross. There's always going to be a cross. Again, the joy of the Lord will sustain us no matter how difficult the circumstances of life tend to be. It is not a joy that is focused on temporal things. It is a joy that transcends temporal things. This is not to say there cannot be interim periods of joy in this world. But it is to say, until Jesus comes, this world remains fallen and we're in it. How good can you possibly have it? And even if you have it good in one way, you're going to have it difficult in another way. The Lord is going to tell you to pick up your cross and follow me. Because without that wretched cross, we would be just like the world. We would be hoping in this world. He considered the joy set before him. The joy of the Lord has a future emphasis, and the joy of the Lord has an emphasis that transcends present circumstances. Just think of the mother in labor waiting for the baby. It is the thought of the baby that sustains her spirits. It is not anything other that's sustaining her spirits. Well, it's, it's just like that. Paul also uses the example of an athlete competing in the ancient Olympics. Speaks of buffeting his body in the rigid difficulties of training. Well, there's something I'm told professional athletes have, they call it the bear, the bear, where it's actually a pain barrier. And they cross the pain barrier, perhaps by endorphins, perhaps simply by convincing themselves it doesn't hurt when it does. <laughs> they cross this barrier. When they're doing it, when they're reaching the point of physical and mental exhaustion, there's no joy in it. But all they see is the Olympic gold. All they see is the Olympic gold. This is another example of the way the joy of the Lord works. It transcends present circumstances and looks to the certainty of the future blessing. It looks to the certainty of the future blessing. A believer, no matter what their circumstance, will have joy. I once met Dr. Joshua Chu. Joshua Chu was somebody arrested with Watchman Nee in China by the communists. Joshua Chu was educated in medical science in the United States and Great Britain. He was a research oncologist, a cancer specialist, and cancer scientist in China. In fact, he was the number one cancer scientist in China. He was the top absolute number one in the country at one point. But he was not a communist. He was a Christian. He was not a member of the Communist Party. And Mao did not like scientists and intellectuals who were not members of the party. So Mao took, or Mao's police, they took the number one research oncologist in China at the time, and they put him in prison. And he spent 13 years in prison, locked up, in horrific circumstances. He was locked up for 13 years in horrific circumstances, semi-solitary confinement. He had very little contact with other people for 13 years. 
Imagine taking a cancer scientist and locking him up for 13 years simply because he was not a member of the Communist Party. Well, that's what they did to him. He had the joy of the Lord, even in those circumstances. Eventually, the Americans got him out. Kissinger eventually negotiated him out. The Americans wanted him to work in Sloan Kettering Cancer Research Hospital in, in New York. The Americans wanted his brain. They eventually got him out of prison, and he was allowed to come to the spoke for, fluent English, of course, is educated in the West. They eventually got him out. But he didn't know he was getting out. He did not know he was ever getting out. As far as he knew, he was going to die there. But he had a joy of the Lord. My wife and myself knew Richard and Sabina Wernbrand. Richard Wernbrand, some of my wife's family, knew him in Romania from the Romanian Jewish community before he was saved. Richard Wernbrand told a number of accounts about what happened when Ceausescu had him in prison in communist Romania. And he was talking about these various things that happened to him under unspeakable circumstances, including torture. And he was once asked the question by someone I, I know that what promises of Jesus sustained you when you were going through this repeated interrogation and torture? And he said, it reached a point where none of the promises of Jesus sustained me anymore. I was well beyond the point of any kind of mental or physical capacity to even think in those terms. None of the promises of Jesus sustained me anymore. Jesus sustained me. Jesus sustained me. The joy comes from Jesus. The focus is him, not the joy. But who is he? He is God. God is love. The essence of God's nature. Therefore, the joy will be there. And he told some incredible stories. I remember one of the stories he told us. This was in Israel. And we knew people who were in prison with him in Israel. Uh, Jewish believers in Jesus who were in prison with him under the communists before they were allowed to immigrate to Israel as Jews. And he told the story of a Romanian scientist who was from the National, he was in the National Academy of Science in, in Bucharest, and he was beaten and tortured repeatedly as they all were. And Richard Wernbrand says sometimes he would wake up in this room, about, he describes it as maybe half the size of this one, with 40 or 50 people in it, and he'd wake up, and the ones on either side of him would be dead the next morning. They just wouldn't recover. They would be dead. Well, he told one day about a Romanian peasant who was being mocked by this scientist. And this scientist was saying to him, look at your Jesus. What is your Jesus doing for you? If your Jesus loves you so much, and if your God is so powerful, why doesn't he get you out of here? If I was a powerful God, and I had that kind of power, and I loved somebody, I wouldn't leave them in here. How can you believe such nonsense? If he loves you, he wouldn't leave you in here. If he's so powerful, why doesn't he get you out of here? Who would love, love somebody uh, like a son or, and leave them in this place? How can you possibly believe in such nonsense? This is what the scientist, who was an atheist, was asking this Romanian peasant who was a Christian, a Baptist. And this Romanian peasant said, he leaves me in here because he loves you too and he wants me to tell you about him before it's too late. So the scientist began to mock him and said, does he talk to you? And he says, he always talks to me. And the scientist says, does he smile at you? And the peasant says, oh yes, he smiles. He tells me I'm coming home to be with him soon. The scientist says, what does he look like when he smiles? And the guy says, he looks like this. And Richard Wernbrand said he doesn't know what that scientist saw, but the scientist fell down on the ground and began pounding his fist. You've seen Jesus Christ. The joy of the Lord. It transcends temporal circumstance. The joy of the Lord. Then Paul continues. The joy of the Lord is agape. Then he goes on, speaks further. 
Where there is agape, there will be kera. Where there is kera, there will be erin, peace. We explained this last night. Erin in Greek simply means the absence of conflict. There is no Greek word to translate the Hebrew word shalom, which means fullness and completeness. Shalom, as I explained last night, comes from the infinitive of the Hebrew verb leshalem, to pay, to fill, to fulfill. Shalom comes from leshalem, to pay, to fill, to fulfill. We have shalom because Jesus came to leshalem to pay the price for our sin, to fulfill the Torah, and to fill us with his spirit. Okay. You can be in the biggest conflict of your life and have shalom. <laughs> you can be in pristine circumstance and not have shalom. <laughs> Jesus said, Shlomi ani yaten lechem, my peace I give you. Lo kamoha olam, not like the world. The world's peace is just an absence of conflict. Now ultimately God's peace, his shalom, will include the absence of conflict. When Jesus returns, the nations will indeed beat their spears into pruning hooks. His shalom will ultimately include the absence of conflict, but that's not what it is. You can be in a conflict, in a terrible conflict, and still have his shalom. You can be on a deathbed and have his shalom. You can be in prison for your faith and have his shalom. You can be facing a death sentence for your faith and have his shalom. You can be in any kind of a crisis and still have his shalom. Well, let's go and look further. Macro tumia. Not patience, but great patience. The fruit of the Spirit is macro tumia. It works like this, that no matter what you or I have to hold against any other believer, God has more to hold against us. He's perfect, we're not. To hold a personal resentment and unforgiveness against a believer, um, God is willing to forgive us, but there's one condition. We have to ask him for the grace to forgive others. He's willing to forgive us, but we must ask him for the grace to forgive others. You want him to forgive you? You want him to forget it ever happened? You want him to erase it, blot it out? (laughs) Do you want him to keep putting up with you as many times as you drop your cross, as many times as we all fail him, do we want him to keep tolerating us anyway and loving us anyway. Yeah. He says, no problem, I can do that. One catch. Will you trust me for the grace to do it also? Now, you can't do it. I have to give you the power to do it. Do you really want me to empower you to have that kind of patience with other people? No matter what we have to hold against other believers... He has a lot more to hold against us. Now, I'm not talking about tolerating unrepentant sin in the fellowship or false doctrine. There may be believers that we just can't work with in the ministry or something like that. That doesn't mean, however, that we're on the war path against them. Uh, Don't hold resentments or grudges. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. He has a lot more against us than we have against others. This relates, of course, to what Jesus spoke about 70 times 7. Let's go further. He goes on speaking. Christotes. The fruit of the Spirit, 
crees tot eso. Kindness. Kindness. But it's not just an ordinary kindness. Anybody can be a kind person, practically, if they wanted to be. No, it goes beyond that. Christotes means to be kind to someone when you have a reason not to be. <laughs> Being kind to someone when you have a reason not to be. Being kind to another believer. Oops. When we have a reason not to be. God is like that. Sometimes Christians do things that warrant the judgment of God. And instead he blesses them. Sometimes by blessing us when he should be perhaps judging us for our stupid actions, that blessing is more of a rebuke than a, a judgment. God likes to repay evil with good. He likes to repay evil with good when and where and up to the point it's possible. Now he also knows the fallen nature of man is such that there are people who will take advantage of his kindness. This is called licentiousness. Licentiousness. Paul warns in no unconditional terms about licentiousness. Licentiousness is a perversion of Christotes, of God's grace. It's a perversion of it. It is where you use his grace as a permit to sin, to continue to live immorally, to continue to practice things we ought not. When people engage in licentiousness, God will suspend his blessing at some point. He will suspend his blessing at some point until they repent. Until they repent. But God far prefers, far prefers to return good for evil as a way to bring conviction to somebody. And he tells us, even in dealing with unsaved people, when we can, if we return good for evil, they can't handle that. <laughs> they can handle vengeance. They can handle somebody getting back at them. But unsaved people have a hard time handling when you return good for evil. Now again, the world is depraved. God is realistic about this. For instance, Islam is a religion and a religious culture that interprets kindness as weakness. Islam is a religion and a religious culture that will misinterpret kindness as weakness. If you show a Muslim, usually, good kindness in response to evil, they will see that as a sign of weakness. That's how they will see it. That's how they will see it, okay? But if a Muslim sees a demonstration of strength, then you show them kindness. <laughs> Put a 45 to his head and say, go ahead, pick up the hand grenade, Alibaba. And then you show him kindness. That freaks him out. <laughs> they can't handle that. Unsaved people cannot handle when you show them kindness in the face of what they've done to you. Unsaved people do not understand how you can return good for evil. This is very important to our witness and testimony. Now again, I'm quite realistic. I know about the Islamic culture and things like this. We operate in Muslim countries and I know that it's not always as cut and dry and easy and smooth as I would like to be. There can be cultural and religious factors when you're dealing with certain people, Muslims chief among them, from my experience. But there is even a way to a Muslim's heart. Once you get by or get past 
the trappings of that culture. Unsaved people. So it's not just, it's first and foremostly showing this to the brethren, Christotes. But it's also important in showing this to unsaved people. Remember, they will be drawn to Jesus through seeing the character of Christ in us. As we bear the fruit of the Spirit, this will draw them to Jesus. Let's continue. Let's look further. The next one is Agathosune. Forget the girl's name, Agatha. Agatho Sune. Goodness. Goodness. This goodness does not simply mean of a righteous moral character. It means a goodness in what motivates the righteous moral character. Somebody may choose to comply with the law because they don't want to get a speeding ticket or a fine, okay? But when you have agathosune, somebody will comply with the law because they don't want to hurt anybody in an accident. <laughs> it's not just the fear of the ticket. It's they want to do what's good. Do unto others as you'd have others do unto you? Well, yeah, sure. It's always to do with the motive for doing the good. Agathosune is not just doing good. It's having the right motive for doing the good. Jesus spoke of giving it without expecting repayment. <laughs> we have money preachers today with the hundredfold heresy that does not even talk about money. But they say if you give to God, you're guaranteed to get back a hundredfold. That becomes the motive for giving. That is not a gathosune. And again, we could never even begin to repay God for what he's done with us, beginning with our salvation. I know somebody who lived in a, at the time it was 150,000 British pounds was the value of the house they lived in in, in, in the north of London. Uh, today's money, three, probably about six million, seven million Australian. But the house, no, sorry, what am I saying? Six, seven hundred thousand Australian dollars in today's money. But the house would really only be worth about a quarter of a million if it wasn't in London. <laughs> being in London is like being in Sydney, just drives the prices up. Well, this person came under the influence of an American televangelist. And he believed by giving the 150000 to the ministry, so-called, this televangelist, he was going to get $1.5 million. <laughs> he sold the house, gave the money to the televangelist, <coughs> thinking <coughs> for his 150000 he was guaranteed $1.5 million. God promised it. He didn't get it. <laughs> Less than a year later, his wife and his four children were still living in a rat-infested slum in a very slimy neighborhood of London. His motive for giving was wrong. Now, if somebody sold their house because God told them to and gave the money to missions or evangelism without any precondition just because God told them to, that would be agathosune. <laughs> it's not good enough to do a good thing. You have to do the good thing with the good motive. That's God's nature. Let's go back to Jesus cursing the fig tree. Israel had the leaves, not the fruit, and had the works, not the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit are God's nature. 
going back to the garden with Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve had a choice to eat of one of two trees. They could eat of the tree of life, the Eitz Hayim. It was Jesus, God's nature. Or they could eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and establish a law to themselves. They ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil instead of eating of the tree of life, which is the life of Christ. They were to take these things from the tree of life. Now we see that tree again restored in Ezekiel 47 in the millennial context, and we see it restored in the book of Revelation. The tree of life is restored. Okay. Unto life eternal. Man had a choice. It's not good enough to have the leaves. You needed to have the fruit. The fruit and the leaves together. Jesus cursed the fig tree. It only had the leaves. The good works are never good enough. You need the fruit, the good motive. Let's continue. The fig leaves are for the healing of the nations, but they're not the fruit. Then it continues. It goes on speaking next. Pistis. Pistis. Pistis is the Greek word for faith. Faith. It essentially means trust. However, <clears throat> it is like the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word for faith is emunah. We get the word amen. Emunah is the Hebrew. Greek is pistis. Pistis is the Greek word for faith. Pistis is the Greek word for faithfulness. Emunah is the Hebrew word for faith. Emunah is the Hebrew word for faithfulness. Neither Greek nor Hebrew make a distinction between faith and faithfulness. If someone's faith is real, they will be faithful. The righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faithfulness. We're saved by grace through faith. We're saved by grace through the faithfulness of Jesus. <laughs> Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faithfulness, it's impossible to please God. Neither Hebrew nor Greek make the distinction we do in English. If the faith is real, the believer will be faithful. If we're not faithful, our faith is not genuine. We are really not trusting in Jesus. Quite a thing. We just don't think of it that way. But that's what it says. And that's what it means. Then it goes on from Pistis. Fruit of the Spirit is preotes. Preotes. Meekness, meekness. Jesus was meek, but he was never weak. The way the world thinks is that meek equals weak. Jesus was indeed meek, but he was never meek. Uh, he was indeed meek, he was never weak. I got it right. He was never weak. What does meekness mean? The characteristic, the defining characteristic of meekness will be using power, authority, strength rightly. 
someone who can use power, strength, and authority rightly. Rightly meaning not just when to do it, not just how much to do it, but with the right motive. <laughs> if somebody is meek, they will use their strength rightly. They will use their authority rightly. Well, if they're a pastor and they're meek, they will use their authority, their position, protectively. They'll protect the sheep from the wolves. Ezekiel 34 denounces heavy shepherding. Jesus hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. A right use of power, a right use of position, a right use of authority. Not just using it in the right circumstances and in the right amount, but with the right motive. Jesus was angry. He was angry at sin. He was angry at religious hypocrisy and corruption. He said, I wish it was already kindled. But he controlled his anger. He knew it was not the right time. God withheld his judgment on Israel and Jerusalem until 70 AD, a whole generation giving them a chance to accept Christ before the axe finally fell in 70 AD. The Lord tarries in the last days. He's angry. The Lord is angry at the way the world is. He restrains his power. In the right way, at the right time, it will be unleashed. People who are not meek should not have power or authority in the body of Christ. If somebody is meek, they don't have to prove it. It's the way they exercise their authority that proves it. Not just the right exercising of the power or the authority, but with the right motive. This is the fruit of the Spirit. What else is the fruit of the Spirit that Paul writes about? Ekrete. Self-control. I've told the story before. I saw people in the Toronto experience and into the Pensacola thing, and they, they were saying, you know, I couldn't control it. It must have been God. I know it was God. I couldn't control it. That's what they were saying. Because they were out of control, to them that proved prima facie it must have been God. Scriptures teach the opposite. The fact that you couldn't control it proves prima facie it could not possibly be of God. I once saw a hype artist money preacher on TV and he was saying things like, when the Spirit of God comes upon me, hallelujah, I have to prophesy Well, the scriptures say the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophet. The fact that you have to do it proves it's not real. Remember, most of what's being called prophecy today is clairvoyance, not prophecy. Most of what's being called prophecy today is clairvoyance. God is in control of somebody to the degree they are in control of themselves. If somebody is not in control of themselves, is God in control of them? Think of an alcoholic. Maybe the alcoholic gets saved. The alcoholic stops drinking. To that person, alcohol is not a beverage. It is a drug. That person should never touch alcohol. If that person goes into a pub and begins hitting the jug, is God in control of them? No. Why? Because they're not in control of themselves. That is no less true spiritually. If God's in control of somebody, they will be in control of themselves. That includes 
the exercising of charismatic gifts. It was again the Greek pagan prophets, the Greek pagans at Delphi with their version of tongues, who were out of control. You see in Kundalini Yoga, the Hindus who practice Kundalini Yoga, they're out of control. When you see this same phenomena in the church, you know it is not the Holy Spirit. It is an alien spirit counterfeiting the Holy Spirit. It cannot possibly be the Spirit of God. These are deeds of the flesh. And so Paul concludes, against such things there is no Torah. Against such things there is no law. Against such things, there is no law. In other words, if people are not bearing the fruit of the Spirit, they are engaging in the deeds of the flesh, they are once again going back under the law of sin and death. They are striving in their flesh. It's the CO2 instead of the helium. Back under the law. We've got the fruit of the Spirit that can only come about because of the Holy Spirit. Against such things, there is no law. This is what Jesus is looking for. When he looks at my life, when he looks at your life, he doesn't say things like, he's a great evangelist. He doesn't say things like, that's a great pastor. He doesn't say things like, that's a great Bible teacher. He's not looking for the gifts. The gifts are what he gives us. In fact, the gifts are what he gives the body through us. He doesn't even give them to us. We don't have any gifts. The body has the gifts. They just operate through us by God's grace. Gifts are what he gives us. Fruit of what we give him. He's not interested in our gifts. He knows what our gifts are. He's interested in how faithful we are in using our gifts. <laughs> but the gifts themselves, they have no importance other than pointing to him. But no importance for us. No, he's looking for fruit. Additionally, He's not looking for our works alone. Oh, if the fruit is there, the works will be there. Faith without works is dead. The fruit will be burned up if the leaves are not there. But he's not looking for the works alone. He's looking for the fruit of the Spirit. Are the works we do because of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives? Am I speaking to you today because of the fruit of the Spirit? Are you witnessing to somebody? Are you preaching the gospel? Are you giving your testimony because of the fruit of the Spirit? If we're not doing it because of the fruit of the Spirit, what we are are trees that have leaves but no fruit. Well, it's quite a challenge, isn't it? And in the present climate, there's less and less fruit. There's less and less rain. There's less and less. Things are not good, and being honest, they don't seem to be getting much better. But once again we read, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. He, or as the case may be, she will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream. They will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green and it will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor will it cease to yield fruit. No matter how post-Christian the Western world becomes, no matter how neo-pagan the Western world becomes, no matter how spiritually dry and bereft of the Holy Spirit the Western world becomes, no matter how backslidden the church becomes, it always comes down to the individual. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. He, 
she will be like a tree planted by the water. We can still have the Holy Spirit. Our leaves can still be green. And we can still bear fruit. It doesn't depend on the church. It doesn't depend on the spiritual climate. It doesn't depend on social trends away from the Judeo-Christian ethic. It doesn't depend on any of that. It only depends where we're planted. It only depends if we're rooted in Christ. Despite the drought, it is still possible to have our leaves green and the branches bearing fruit. Every tree that bears fruit, don't cut it down, he says. He will never cut down a tree that bears fruit. Even in the worst age of human history in Revelation 7, he says, don't cut those trees down. Don't touch them. He told Israel, if they're bearing fruit, don't cut down that tree for the siege works. Don't touch that tree. Let it bear fruit. Let the leaves be green. May the Lord in his grace keep our trees fruitful and our leaves green. God bless.